Hey, it's NPR's Book of the Day. I'm Andrew Limbong. It's been interesting to see how different works of art handle the pandemic now that we're, sheesh, yeah, a few years past the early days of COVID. Like, if you're writing contemporary fiction, do you ignore it or address it? Does it play a key part or is it just in the background? How much COVID stuff do you need to have versus how much is the audience willing to handle? Today on the pod, we've got two massive authors who place their novels squarely in pandemic times. In a bit, Michael Cunningham, the guy who wrote The Hours, talks about writing human beings in a pandemic versus you know writing about a pandemic. But first, NPR's Leila Fadel talks to Sigrid Nunez, whose book The Vulnerables uses animals as a way of talking about loneliness and caring. That's after the break. This message comes from Apple. Apple Gift Card is a practical gift that unlocks a world of entertainment and fun. You can send it via email or give a physical card to your loved ones, friends, or family. They can use Apple Gift Card to buy Apple products, accessories, apps, and games. But they can also use the funds to pay for music, movies, TV shows, and more. Visit Apple.com for details and to send Apple Gift Cards to your friends and family this holiday season. Animals loom large in the novels of Sigrid Nunez. The Friend, which won a National Book Award in 2018, addresses mourning with the help of a Great Dane. Mitts from 1998 is the biography of a tiny marmoset monkey. Her 2010 apocalyptic novel Salvation City, about a global flu pandemic, features a basset hound named Sad-Eyed Lady of the Lowlands, just like the Bob Dylan song. In The Vulnerables, her ninth novel out today... Nunez takes her readers to another pandemic, New York, in COVID lockdown in 2020. Her narrator, an unnamed writer, ends up caring for a macaw parrot whose owner gets stuck in California. It's an ode to our basic need to connect with other beings, be they human or animal, even in a global crisis that told us to stay apart. Nunez told me how her own meditations on the pandemic inspired the story. It was time to write another book. And for a time during the spring of 2020, like most writers I know, I wasn't able to write because of fears and concerns about the pandemic and the lockdown. But it came to mind, the first sentence of Virginia Woolf's novel, The Years, it was an uncertain spring. And taking off from there, I started to write about what was happening in our uncertain spring. You mentioned that you struggled to write when the pandemic happened and everybody went into lockdown. And the female narrator in this book also struggles to write in this moment of loneliness and separation. How much of her is you and how much of her is invention? Most of my books are are hybrid books. There's a um, you know, there's always a story, a plot, and characters, invented characters. But there are elements of my autobiography in there. And with a book like The Vulnerables, what happens is that the story is invented, not every bit of it, but most of it. For example, the pandemic really happened. The lockdown really happened. The narrator locks down with the macaw and a college student. And these types of birds form a very strong bond with the person who cares for them. How did Eureka become a central part of this story? macaws are, just as you say, they bond with people, they're beautiful, they're extremely intelligent. And I've never owned a parrot, but there used to be a, an exotic bird store on Bleecker Street, and when I was living nearby there, I used to go there very, very often to look at and interact with the birds. The narrator, like other people, can't do other things, and having trouble deciding, what should I do, what is important right now? And as she says in the book, this was one thing on my agenda that I didn't have to question. The bird needed care. I knew how to give it. I was there to give it. It was a, it was a simple, direct task. And it gave me a great deal of pleasure, she says. The company is so consoling. I was very moved by that, the, the importance of caring for a being other than yourself. The female writer who is the main narrator who writes, uh, though I've had several pets, I count not having had more animals in my life among my biggest regrets. Is that also something from your life that is part of this book? Exactly. I wouldn't attribute that kind of idea to the narrator if I didn't share it. It's part of her character, it's part of her sensibility, and it is part of mine. And yes, that is a regret I've had for, for quite some time. 
How did this Gen Z college student become central as well? I mean, ultimately, they form a bond in this extreme loneliness and fear that the pandemic was intergenerational. He shows up unexpectedly at the apartment where she's bird sitting and their relationship grows from hostile to aloof to actually close. Can you describe that relationship? Well, he's somebody who was in college in his last year when, like other college students, he was suddenly told, well, you've got to go home, we're closing down. And so he goes to be with his parents in Vermont. He is someone who has had lots of troubles. He spent a summer in a psychiatric hospital being treated for a very serious eating disorder. And that is behind him at this point. But he clashes terribly with his parents. And in fact, they end up telling him he's got to go. And that's how he comes down to Manhattan and ends up in this apartment. He had originally been the bird sitter. He still has keys to that apartment. He suddenly shows up. She is, as a friend says to her, don't be so territorial. It's a big apartment. It's an emergency. Deal with it. Stop complaining. He's being very nice to you. Why can't you be nice back, etc.? And then something happens to her outside that is very upsetting, and he can tell. He has an idea that she's also not eating, and he has an idea that if he leaves an edible for her, that it will help her to eat, to feel better, and to feel less anxious and less depressed. And so they they begin to, to do that. They begin to take some kind of marijuana most days, and then they end up talking to each other and revealing certain things and, and laughing a lot and enjoying each other's company. It did feel like almost a, a meditation on companionship in loneliness and in isolation. Well, and of course, she's this is this this narrator doesn't have any children of her own, has never had children. So there, you know, there is a certain maternal feeling that she that she begins to have for him. And I also think that although it's described as unlikely, I don't think it's all that unlikely what happens between them. In fact, I think that was part of the point of the story that you know, when people are thrown together in situations like that, people do realize how much they need each other and how much they can give each other, even in small ways. I mean, that he would notice her distress, even though she hasn't been particularly nice to him, and feel like he could do something to alleviate that, I think is the most natural human feeling in the world. That's author Sigrid Nunez. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. This message is brought to you by Apple Pay. Plastic cards can be stolen, copied, skimmed, and even fraudulently swiped. Instead, pay the Apple way. Apple Pay is easy, secure, and built into iPhone. All you have to do is set it up. Just add a card in the Wallet app and you're good to go. This message comes from Meta for Work. It's not just sci-fi anymore. Virtual and mixed reality are transforming how business works. Architects can use mixed reality to walk through buildings that aren't even built yet. People from around the world can work shoulder to shoulder in virtual spaces. And all sorts of professionals are getting hands-on training in safer, more cost-effective virtual environments. Meta for Work. Work smarter, closer, safer, together. Learn more at forwork.meta.com. Support for this podcast and the following message come from South Carolina Federal Credit Union. Folks listening to this in a vehicle they're tired of owning are in luck. South Carolina Federal provides auto loans that could help reduce the costs of commutes and road trips. And there's no payment due for 90 days after closing. To learn more about how fast, friendly financing can get drivers behind the wheel and out on the road, visit scfederal.org. Loans subject to approval. Certain restrictions apply. All right, maybe unsurprisingly, besides COVID, there's another common thread between the two books we're talking about today, Virginia Woolf. Sigrid Nunez talked about the years just a bit ago, but when Michael Cunningham spoke to NPR Scott Simon about his novel Day, it's Mrs. Dalloway that's the reference point. Here it is. Michael Cunningham has written his first novel in almost a decade. Did it take the pandemic to do it? Day brings us into a circle of family and friends in three days, April 5, 2019, 2020, and 2021. 
It spans the pandemic through which the world lived and during which so many people died and so many hopes and dreams were smashed and rearranged. Michael Cunningham, who won the Pulitzer Prize for his 1998 novel, The Hours, joins us now from New York. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. We've interviewed so many novelists over the past year who said they found it hard to work during the pandemic because life seemed suspended. How did you begin to tell yourself, nah, this is what I want to write about? Your phrase, smashed and rearranged, could have been the working title for the novel, but that, <laughs> but that didn't seem ultimately like the right thing to call it. I was in the middle of a very different novel when the pandemic roared in, and I just put that novel aside. There was no way to sort of work the pandemic in without looking like I was working the pandemic in. It didn't seem possible to write a contemporary novel that did not acknowledge the pandemic. But at the same time, how do you write a novel about human beings in the pandemic as opposed to writing a novel about the pandemic? Well, tell us about this um, this Brooklyn family that is at the heart of the book, uh, Dan. Holding on to the rock musician he might have been, Isabel, his wife, who holds the family together, and their children, Violet and Nathan, and then Isabel's brother, Robbie, who lives in the attic. Real New York arrangement, by the way. (laughs) It is very New York. They are prisoners of New York real estate, among their other qualities, yeah. Well, tell us about them. Yeah, sure. The situation in which they find themselves in the first third of the novel before the pandemic is that Isabel and Dan are in a marriage that isn't holding up all that well. It's not turning out to be quite what either of them had in mind. And each of them is in certain ways in love with Robbie, who is Isabel's younger brother who is a single gay man. Let me stop you there. They're both in love with Robbie. That's a complicated situation even for Brooklyn. (laughs) It's about idealism. It's about the person with whom you cannot have an actual romance because he's your brother, because you're straight and married to his sister. You know, it's about the chimera of another person who looks as if they might have been a better bet, even though they probably wouldn't have been, but who comes with what can be a sort of strangely enlivening body of absolute limitations. The structure of this novel is a single day taken across three years. Your famed novel, The Hours, obviously a single day. You you have acknowledged not just a debt to Virginia Woolf. Your life was really changed direction when you first read her. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I read her when I was pretty young and um, not much of a reader. I read Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway, and I realized for the first time that it was possible to write sentences like that, to produce prose with that kind of grace and balance and complexity and musicality. And that is really, I think, what turned me into a reader and then ultimately into somebody who began to try to write. I have read that you were once a bartender. I was. um, When I graduated from college, I got into my third-hand car and drove out into the mad American night thinking that I would sort of wrestle a novel out of it, out of whatever was out there. And, you know, I kind of loved it for as long as I did. My very favorite job was my last one before I went to graduate school in a bar no longer with us called the Boom Boom Room in Laguna Beach, where the bartender wore grass skirts and lays. And let's just say that I kind of loved it. It was so public. It was so fast. It was so chaotic. But 
I have retired my grass skirt and my lay, and I promise you no one wants to see me dressed like that anymore. I, well, it doesn't sound like the place that would fit the question I'm about to ask, but I'm still curious. Did people tell you their problems? Um, yes. People tell you their problems. They manifest their problems. You you get their problems just coming rampaging at you across the bar with or without an actual confession to the bartender. And um, you know, one of the surprises to me was I wasn't, if you will, gathering material as I thought I would. Those people's stories were their stories, and I listened to them, and I let them go. Um, in, in the course of the three years of this story, of course, some of the characters move, move away, or, or just away from each other, or closer. And there's a line near the end in which Dan, the old rocker, says, he finally realizes... To quote you, an artist is someone who refuses to listen to reason. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You include yourself? Oh, yeah. I would probably venture to apply that to almost anybody who writes, who paints, who acts, who does anything that is hard to feel recognized about, at least until enough time passes and you get lucky. Um, you know the odds against anyone becoming a writer who is actually read. Not to mention the fact that going into year three, working in a gay tiki bar in Laguna Beach, your parents begin to wonder why they sent you to college in the first place place <laughs> but for i think for many of us we just have to insist on doing what we want to do anyway even though the odds are stacked against us even though people are beginning to lose faith in us whatever it is you just sort of tie yourself to the mass and hope michael cunningham's new novel is called day Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. And that's not all for this week. Catch us tomorrow with a bonus episode in your feed. Thanks. Paywalls limiting access to news aren't our style at NPR. We're on a mission to create a more informed public, and you can join us by giving today at npr.org slash donate. This message comes from NPR sponsor Autograph Collection, part of Marriott Bonvoy. Each of the almost 300 independent hotels in the Autograph Collection are designed to be exactly like nothing else. Visit AutographCollection.com to find something unforgettable. This message comes from NPR sponsor Mint Mobile. From the gas pump to the grocery store, inflation is everywhere. So Mint Mobile is offering premium wireless starting at just $15 a month. To get your new phone plan for just $15, go to mintmobile.com slash switch.